because what you don't know about energy can kill you. Here's Alex Epstein. Welcome to Power Hour. I'm Alex Epstein. All right, I'm going to jump right into this week's interview. Uh, I just did it a couple days ago. I'm very excited about it. My guest is going to be Meredith Angwin. She is the author of my new favorite book about electricity called Shorting the Grid. I also really like Robert Bryce's book, so I don't want to give short shrift to him. But this book in particular highlights an issue I've been thinking about and getting increasingly mad about for the past six plus months, which is what she calls the hidden fragility of our grid. And, and I have called it in the past, our grid being rigged against reliables. Meredith has written the best book that I've seen, the best set of explanations I've seen as to how our grid has gone downhill. And she has some ideas as to how to fix it. So I was very excited to bring her on the show. I think you'll enjoy the interview. And if you like the interview, get her book. All right. With that said, enjoy my interview with Meredith Angwin, and I'll see you on the other side. I'm joined now by Meredith Angwin, author of the excellent book, Shorting the Grid. Meredith, welcome to Power Hour. I'm so happy to be here, Alex. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, my pleasure. So full disclosure, I'm a third of the way through the book. Usually I read books more quickly than I'm reading this one, but this one is really, really good and it has a lot of detail. So I really, I've been taking a lot of notes on it. And my first question is just, how did you write such a clear and good book on the grid? One thing I'm going to talk about is I think the grid is commented on in incredibly vague and useless ways. So how, how did you learn all of this stuff? Well, in many ways, I've been learning some of it all my life because I, I was uh, I was in the utility industry um, as a researcher, and I did research on uh, pollution control and and on uh, corrosion control, and so I, I ended up lear learning a lot about different uh, features of the industry uh, and and the technologies. And then when I came. I, I began to really be in favor of nuclear energy. And when I came out to um, Vermont, I found myself uh, trying to help keep our Vermont Yankee plant going. And I started a blog about it. And I think that's where the, my education really began because um, things would happen on the grid. There'd be some statement by FERC or some statement by ISO New England, and I'd try and figure it out. And I'd, you know, I'd write about it and I'd research it and stuff, and I would try and figure it out. And then at one point, somebody who was reading my book said, you know, Meredith, would you like to run for coordinating committee of the consumer liaison group associated with ISO New England. And I said, I know ISO New England. Can you explain the rest of the, what you said? <laughs> but anyway, I ran for that committee. I was on that committee for four years. And it was an incredible education in, in what goes on in the grid and how decisions are made. And uh, it, it, I just really uh, appreciated that man reading my blog and saying, well, you know, you're writing about it. So anyway. So I've been researching the book uh, as a book for several years, and before that, I was I was I was on the committee for four years. So uh, I guess that's how I learned about it. Well, it's it's super timely. I mean, I've had a view for years that like there's something very off with grid policy, but my my own focus has been more on like energy for transportation. I definitely knew much more about that. And then maybe six months ago, I started really getting into it and really becoming suspicious. And then you're, I just saw your work and I thought, oh my gosh, somebody has really laid all of this out. Like it is just as unfair as I, as I thought. So let's, let's jump into, and I want to talk first, setting context about, I want to challenge the idea and you challenge this, but I just want to raise it that you challenge the idea that electricity today is competitive in the sense that we would think of it like with airlines or phones or computers. And I think it's important to, to debunk this because when you when we hear commentary, we hear like, oh, solar and gas are out competing coal or nuclear and these kinds of things. All, it has all the language of competition. And so I think we assume, oh, it's a competitive thing and whatever happens is the best thing that could happen because it's a competitive outcome. How do you see the modern electricity grid in terms of competitive or not? 
Well, it's not competitive. And uh, I, I, um, I, I was finding that out on the committee, understanding what was going on. And there was also uh, uh, an article that came out, which, which basically said, can electricity markets ever be really competitive? And in that mar uh, article, uh, the um, uh, a man who'd been a, um, a regulator in the electricity markets pointed out that the rules for the quote, deregulated competitive markets were three times as thick as the rules for the, the regulated market. And, 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 and as I watched things on the committee, I could see the rules building up, you know, they make this rule, oh my gosh, it's unfair to somebody. Okay, we're making a rule to fix that. Oh my gosh, it's unfair to somebody else. Oh my gosh, we're and, and the rules, it's a series of band-aids. It's just a series of band-aids. Uh, and and uh, one of the reasons is that uh, another thing is that a real deregulated situation, the consumer gets choices. I mean, if I go down to the local grocery store, I can buy, you know, zucchini or I can buy organic zucchini, my choice, okay? I can pay a little more for what I think is a better product. I can pay a little less. I can say none of the zucchinis look good today. Um, I am the consumer and I have the choice. But in the regulated, deregulated markets, I could just call them the RTO markets. The consumers aren't making the choice. Distribution utilities are making the choice in an automatic auction that runs every five minutes. So they're buying the cheapest thing that's available for the next five minutes with no particular guarantee that it'll be available in an hour and a half. Uh, <laughs> and, and so, you know, so then they put in a day ahead auction because after all, they do need to know that there's, it's going to be available for more than the next five minutes. But it is just an endless series of, of, of rather strange rules and rather odd auctions and it, the consumer, except in a few states, Illinois uh, and New Hampshire, consumers actually can do some choosing. But the rest of the RTO systems, which are extensive, okay, very extensive, the consumer doesn't have a choice. They just buy, just like in the regulated systems. Yeah, I, I found that to be a very powerful point. And we'll, we'll get into all of these in more detail. But I, I think of it more as it's always been a monopoly. And it's just it's switched from one vendor policy to another. And the one it switched to is incredibly uh, irrational. Like, as you said, they just decided on a vendor policy, we'll buy from whatever vendor gives us the lowest quote in the next five minutes. And then you can think, oh, is that a good way to make a vendor policy if you want the lowest cost reliable energy for the next 20 years? And I think <laughs> we'll see that's that's not the case. But let's let's start off with as context, and you do this really well in the book, the system before, we'll talk about RTO, but the system before the RTO, so the classic regulated monopoly, and it, so which you say has certain strengths and certain weaknesses. Let's just start out with how did the classic regulated monopoly work? Okay, the classic regulated monopoly is, is a, a, a utility and it, and it has certain obligations. It owns some power plants, it owns transmission lines, or it pays a, for use of a portion of a transmission line, and it owns a distribution system, and it writes you the bill, and it gets paid the bill. And then if it turns out that it's winter in the Northeast and someone's been laid off in your family and you have to get a, a, some, a, allowance made for paying your bills late, it makes that allowance. In other words, it's really everything. It's from generating the electricity to the customer service for the customer, you know, a, a downed wire, uh, a problem in the household where they have to have a, a three month extension on their payments. All that is in one place. Well, that has the strength that the they were very, very concerned with reliability. And that was really important. So it was a very reliable system. Now, why were they, just to play devil's advocate, why are they so concerned with reliability? I mean, if it's just one monopoly, why do they care so, why well, don't they just they, say, they, oh, we can be unreliable? They were supervised by their local public utilities commission, which in some states was called the public service board, but let's go public utilities commission. Okay. and. Um, the public service, the, uh, uh, the uh, Public Utilities Commission gave them 
an allowed rate of return. That is, if you invest this much money and your power is this reliable, then you can make 5% on your investment. In other words, it was like a cost plus contract. Whatever you pay, we'll, pay, we'll make sure you get that back. So uh, how, did, how, could they, how could they make more money? Unfortunately, one way they could make more money was to overbuild. We invested that much money, you better pay us for it. And another way was to make sure it was really reliable so the PUC didn't say, um, hmm, Actually, we're going to have to assess a pretty serious fine for that outage. You had two outages in a row. We don't like it. You're fined. So the rate of return would go down. And, and sometimes the PUCs were even direct. They said, because of your outages, your rate of return is lower. So they were into reliability and they were to some extent into overbuilding because overbuilding meant they had more, uh, more of a, a base to put that rate of return on. And so, yeah, let's let's talk about that because I think it's one of the obvious potential weaknesses of such a situation. If you get paid cost plus, then all things being equal, you're, you're um, incentivized to increase the cost, your quote investment. So one point you make in the book is arguably it's too much what they would call reserve margin. So in a sense, there's too much capacity. And so you're, you're valuing reliability too much. Now you say this, you know, that's not such a bad thing compared to other things. I mean, because reliability is so important. You also mentioned, I think, maintenance, right? I mean, there is kind of an incentive to do more maintenance. Like I, I wish that PG&E in California, where I live, had done more maintenance yeah. on their lines. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, PG&E uh, definitely it, 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 it cut corners on maintenance and no one can, no one can, it, I mean, is this, that's why it's bankrupt now, right? I mean, because it got sued for all the wildfires that it started. And uh, yeah, the thing is that anything that they paid on maintenance, they got re re paid for by the ratepayers. And you think, oh, the poor ratepayers are just going to be driven into the ground. But they're not. I mean, I, I, I try to look. There are very few studies that compare um, the cost in an RTO system in the, and the cost in, uh, in the uh, old fashioned regulated systems. And the four that I found did, had very different methodologies and stuff. But all four of them showed that the costs in the uh, in the uh, RTO systems, the auction systems, the cost to the consumer was higher than in the regulated system. And I'll tell you one thing that I, I think about this, and that is that I had to study this stuff on site in a way in the consumer liaison group for four years before I had understood what was going on. And with the PUC, the PUC often holds open hearings. Come and say what you think of this. It, 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 it announces rate cases and, and, and you, you can write a letter to it. Uh, the RTO systems, a lot of the th things that happen are in closed rooms. Uh, often reporters aren't even allowed. And uh, it's hard to explain them to somebody. For example, um, I, 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 could, I could spend the rest of the hour with you explaining what the jump ball MOPR and CASPR uh, rulings were about. You don't want to do that. But what I'm trying to say is you can't even figure out what these are about. This is a, a minimal office price ruling, minimal, minimal offer price ruling and the uh, sponsored utility price ruling. Uh, they're in the capacity markets. I'm sure everybody on, on the street knows what a capacity market is. No, they don't. They know what a power plant is. They know what a transmission line is. They know what a rate is. They know how much they're going to be charged. They, the, the ISOs build so many, so many acronyms and, 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 and rules and three times as many rules as other things, and, and people can't figure it out. No, oh, so we're going to try to get to the essence of, of it, at least not not an hour in, of detail in those uh, specific <laughs> things. But so we're going to now go to okay. So this this system, whatever its weaknesses, had I mean, it was providing relatively low cost, reliable electricity all over the place. 
uh, for a long time. And now it's been replaced by de so-called deregulation, which is not deregulation at all. And as you pointed out, it involves more costs and more regulation. So let's start off with, you've used the term RTO. We haven't defined it yet. So let's, let's talk about this phony deregulation, which is manifest in this RTO system. So what are RTOs and, and how did they begin? Okay. RTOs are regional transmission organizations. And um, what they are is uh, an area on the map, mostly a contiguous area. And all the, uh, the customers and the power plants and the transmission lines and the, um, the distribution utilities in that area are members of the regional transmission organization. And the regional transmission organization has one very important role that somebody has to do and uh, and that is, it has to run the, uh, the dispatch. So it has a big um, uh, uh, control room where everything is, is, is shown, the, the, the power lines, the generators, whether, whether they're on or off, uh, whether there's some problem with one power plant getting um, uh, getting fuel, it's all in that room and they're dispatching to, because you have to, you have to have as much uh, electricity supply as electricity used in real time. And that's what I call the angelic miracle of the grid. You have these millions of customers, hundreds of power plants, all kinds of transmission lines and distribution lines, and it's always matched. And that is done mainly through these uh, central uh, systems. So that's good. But the thing was that it, it, it turned out that in earlier days, uh, transmission lines would say, well, we're not going to carry power for that company. So that company might say, I want to build a power plant over here, I have the land, I have the, the uh, permits, and the local uh, company in that area might say, huh, <laughs> no, you're not, because we own the transmission lines. So there was a lot of feeling that if, if, if there was more um, central uh, dispatch and so forth, the power plants would be built more reasonably, the transmission would be cheaper, and some of that actually does happen. Unfortunately, the auctions for everything just ruin it. I mean, but basically that that was the idea that there would be more reason in how a uh, transmission went. That's why they're called regional transmission organizations. So then let's, and, and you emphasize the point, I want to just keep emphasizing it, how with electricity, you have to have this continuous match of supply and, and demand, or you could think of it as production and consumption. So it's, and that is really impressive. I mean, I just, I was thinking yesterday, I was riding my electric skateboard around Long Beach and I was just thinking, oh, you know, I, I it's, it has a big battery so I can run it for 16 miles. And then I was just thinking, you know, anywhere I plug this in, it's going to be fine. Like nobody told them in advance, oh, Alex is going to be plugging in this skateboard but they can accommodate it. And of course, with industry, they can accommodate uh, infinitely bigger fluctuations. So this is very, very impressive thing that we often take for granted. And so let's now talk about the RTO auction system, which I think is the core of what's going on. So describe that. Okay, uh, the RTO auction system is um, a complex thing, but let me, let me try and start with a very simple example. So, uh, the RTO has done all kinds of projections and it says we are going to need uh, 400 megawatts of power in the next five minutes to 400 megawatts times five minutes worth of power, okay? And so it says, okay, uh, which of you power plants can supply this? So one power plant comes up and says, I've got 100 megawatts and I can give, you, give it to you for two cents. 
And another little power plant comes up and says, I've got 200 megawatts, I can give it to you for three cents. And another power plant comes up and says, I've got 200 megawatts too, and, and it'll, be, it'll be six cents. Six cents per, mega, per, uh, per kilowatt hour, that is. Uh, uh, it, it, these are all, I, I should, probably should have done it a different way, but these are all in cents per kilowatt hour. So the RTO says, okay, you power plant over there, you can give me uh, 100 megawatts um, uh, at two cents, great, I'll take it. Uh, now, uh, you, uh, you utility over here, you can give me uh, 200 megawatts at five cents, okay, I'll take it. And you, you are offering me uh, another 200 megawatts, but at uh, uh, six cents or whatever it was, uh, I don't need that much. I'm gonna only take 100 of yours. Okay, so now I've got it. You were offering at six cents and you set the price. All three, everybody who bid into this five minutes gets six cents per kilowatt hour. The highest price sets the, uh, the amount that's paid. So this is a little odd in the first place. And, and, and there are studies that show that pay as bid instead of pay as the clearing price, that is the highest price that was accepted, uh, might save money. But we don't, the, the RTOs don't do it that way. I'm not sure it would save money, but I think it could. <laughs> so I, is that, is it, um, I hope- Well, let, I- let me just make a quick comment about that because I just want to emphasize this is a, uh, maybe arbitrary isn't the quite word, quite the right word, but this is just an art, I'll say it's an arbitrary vendor payment policy. There's not, it's nothing like Apple sells a computer, Microsoft sells a computer, I decide what is the best one in a free market. This is just, they decide, you know, the utility system or the RTOs are deciding to pay vendors according to who offers me the best deal in the next five minutes. And then I'm going to pay them the amount of the worst best deal that somebody, like it's all just, somebody just made this up. And so I wanna emphasize this, that if if it's just a made up policy, it's not a free market, then we should have a lot of scrutiny on it. And we should almost assume that it's not gonna be very fair if it's this arbitrary vendor payment policy. So I just wanna highlight that aspect and to dissociate this from a free market where there are real competitors who are competing for our dollars as consumers. I totally agree with you on that. And one of the things that this kind of thing does is that um, there's a reason for the different vendors to want things to be going badly on the grid. Because when things are going badly on the grid, then the grid operator is calling in the really expensive power plants. And then the clearing price is way up there. So everybody's making money when things are going badly. When it's on the margin of of maybe failure and 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 the power pl- and what is usually um, uh, a grid wholesale price of three to eight cents a kilowatt hour has gone up to twenty to thirty cents a kilowatt hour or even higher, the, the power plants are making money good. So they, 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 it's the opposite of of paying for reliability. It's the opposite, and as you say, it is just a decision on how to run it. It is not something, I mean, I can tell you that, uh, you know, uh, that uh, uh, there's a relationship between uh, power and resistance and voltage. And and this relationship is in a, is in a, uh, uh, an equation, and, and you're not going to change that relationship. That is the relationship. But this hasn't got anything to do with that. This is just like, in other words, these bids and the, the power plants making the most money when the things are most fragile, that isn't, uh, that isn't the, um, that isn't written in, 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 a, in a physical law somewhere. That's a decision. So let's just emphasize the issue of reliability because this is a point you emphasized in the book that under this system, no, so if, if you're saying we're going to take the best bid for the next five minutes, no one is responsible for reliability. Could you, because that can be hard to believe for people because I think they think, well, of course, of course these guys know what they're doing. So can you explain how really no one is responsible for reliability? Well, 
Well, yes, and 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 uh, I, I was just in a, a a meeting that ISO New England was putting on Zoom, and uh, their sort of keynote for the meeting was like uh, one of the problems with the uh, RTO system. I'm paraphrasing what he said is that nobody's actually responsible for resource adequacy. Resource adequacy is the buzzword for <laughs> we've got enough power to make make this happen. Um, and, and, and basically, that that is true. I mean, in in the old days with the uh, regulated utilities, what you had to watch out for was that they would build too many power plants and over you'd be overpaying for reliability. Uh, in this situation, ISO New England uh, can't force anybody to, to be online, and they're trying. What I mean is, it turns out in the winter in New England, uh, power plants um, can't get natural gas and went offline. And, and ISO New England was trying to fix this, and it, I, I have a whole section in my book because I feel that unless you actually watch how how they tried, how it got shot down, how they tried a different way, how it got shot down. You won't believe that just we have to have enough power on a cold day in New England is such a gigantic problem, and it is. Well, yeah, let's talk about that example because I really like that section of the book. And you, you so in the way I understand it is that, well, obviously people, so in winter, it gets cold. Yes. And then, and so I understand that. And I, you know, I have relatives growing up in New England, so I experienced that a bit. Mm -hmm. And then, th as I understand it, in New England, you know, there's a lot of gas for heat, which makes sense because gas is incredibly efficient in terms of uh, heating homes. And then the gas lines for gas for heat gets priority over gas for electricity, right? So then, right. so right. you complete the story from from there. Okay, so the gas for heat gets priority over gas for electricity. And so on a very cold day, when everybody's using a lot of the gas for heat, the pipelines cannot deliver enough gas for both the, um, the home heating and for the power plants that use natural gas. And the power plants are being stressed too, because although, as I said, a lot of homes use... Uh, uh, natural gas, uh, other homes aren't connected to natural gas, and frequently uh, these homes have a little ex electric space heater in the bathroom or in a bedroom or something like that, and when it's really cold, uh, they may not be well insulated, not the, the fanciest homes, and they'll turn on the electric heat space heater for a while. So the power plants have more demand than usual and less gas than usual. So this could lead to rolling blackouts. As a matter of fact, the grid operator did a whole bunch of scenarios, and in many of the scenarios for the future, there were rolling blackouts. So the grid operator would tell me that they were not doing predictions, they were doing scenarios. 19 of the 23 scenarios led to rolling blackouts. Okay, so uh, in 2025. So here we go. Uh, we've got a problem. The power plants get, can't get natural gas. Luckily, or for whatever reason, many power plants that burn natural gas can also get oil and shoot it in through uh, alternate nozzles and burn it just like natural gas. So if the power plant can get oil, then it will be, um, it will be uh, okay to keep running. Well, how is the power plant going to get oil? Well, the, the power plant, hopefully, supposedly the power plant will buy oil in the, in the, um, in the spring, uh, I'm sorry, in the in the summer, in order to have it available for the winter, there's no incentive for the power plant to do. That. And not if you're buying for the next five minutes. That's not, not going to be. That's never going to be the cheapest for the next five minutes. That's right. And if you want to buy that oil, there's no rate base to put it in. You're just you're just spending money, man, and 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 it just isn't going to help you. So. What happened was that the grid operator said, okay, we have a problem here, and we're going to allow two kinds of um, uh, things to bid in to provide, uh, power plants can bid in, it'll cost me this much to buy oil, and other, uh, we're running an auction here, uh, and other, and demand response, people can bid in to say, 
uh, don't worry, I'm going to turn off my electricity if it's really cold. You can ask me to do it and I'll do it. And so um, anyway, as I don't know, when, I'd have to look it up in my book, but basically lots and lots of bids for, <laughs> for uh, we can buy oil. And indeed, I saw New England spent out of $20 million or more buying oil. There weren't that many people bidding in to turn off their electricity if it got really cold. The ISO New England indeed asked for such bids, but only ended up spending about two, three thousand, four thousand dollars on them because there weren't that many bids. Good, so, for, good for the people. <laughs> what? I'm glad the people refused that deal. I mean, that's that's the dangerous stuff, you know, yeah, being cold. I, that is a dangerous idea in general to do demand response on very cold days. I mean, if you have an industry with processes that can be turned off uh, and not hurt anything, I suppose, but there weren't industries bidding in either. <laughs> they didn't want to do that. So meanwhile, um, it was it was barely succeeding. We had, uh, uh, I have a picture in, in the book of, 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 of uh, ISO New England looking at, 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 at a, the oil available at a power plant at the beginning of a particular cold snap. Uh, and the cold snap was uh, over uh, New Year's Day 2000, I'm sorry, 2018 and, and late in the holiday season 2017. So anyway, at the beginning of the cold snap, the average power plant that was a participant in the winter reliability program that bought oil had about seven days worth of oil on site. When the cold snap broke, it had about one day of oil. And someone said to me, well, what would happen if the cold snap went on a couple of days? I said, well, we're lucky it didn't. <laughs> but yeah, that's what we're relying on right now yeah. is, is the but weather we, to be favorable. We're, we're, I don't think that what like that being in New England and relying on favorable weather is a winning plan. It just isn't. But at any rate, it, the, the winter reliability program absolutely did save our bacon at that point. You can say, well, if the cold snap had gone on another four days, it wouldn't have saved your bacon. Well, to some extent, to be without electricity for four days is better than being without electricity for 11 days. So it still did a lot of good even if it had not just squeaked through saving us. At which point, FERC said, yeah, you run that- for FERC, FERC, that's the Federal Energy Regulatory, Electricity Regulatory Commission, right? Right, the, the Federal Electricity Energy Regulatory Commission, I believe. I'm, not, I, I'm losing it. Um, I'm gonna have to- They definitely it. regulate electricity at the federal level. Yes, 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 and uh, I'm, 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 this is really embarrassing, but I, I hate to be inaccurate. And I- No, do. you're right. It is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So I am, I am wrong. Oh, okay. Thank you. Because they, they also regulate um, pipelines and they regulate uh, how dams are operated. So I, I was pretty sure it was energy. Well, at any rate, FERC, uh, FERC said, um, I said, New England, we've allowed you to run that fed, that winter reliability project for um, for three years, it's over. Uh, well, we've given you three years warning that you could only run it for three years, but it's over because it specified certain kinds of uh, uh, energy. It specified oil, it specified demand response. You have to have a full market-based uh, uh, um, system where everybody can bid in and that's what it has to be. You can't, you can't just allow reasonably, uh, people that can reasonably actually uh, do it to bid in, you, you have to, well, that's my interpretation. You have to allow everybody to bid in, you know? Um, and uh, the, so the, luckily uh, the ISO New England and, and related things are, have a, a lot of lawyers and they worked out a thing called paper performance. And paper performance uh, was basically the idea was that if you get fined for not being online in the winter, that fine will be so big that you would have rather have stockpiled oil. So the idea was that you would, we would, we would, we would set up the incentive so that you would know to stockpile oil. Well, 
it, it didn't work. As a matter of fact, it it, it went it went into um, it went through many many iterations of exactly how to assess this and so forth and so on. And the idea was that you would take money from plants that didn't go online and give that money to plants that did go online. So it turned out that right after paper for performance was implemented, oh, and the, the numbers of go rounds of, of how to set up the formula, uh, many people were involved in those. And so it ended up being quite a, a complex formula. So um, many people, many entities, you know, FERC and ISO New England and Neepool, they were all, they all had their say on how to set up this, this thing. And, and you, you understand that setting up this formula is the way you save a market. Right. <laughs> this is a market. No, it's not a market. It's a formula, guys. It's a formula. It's a very reductionist, uh, top-down directive formula. Well, at any rate, the first time I, it were, went into effect was in um, September, actually, because the grid was stressed when a major, major power plant went offline unexpectedly while it was the hottest, humid, most humid day in, 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 uh, in quite a long time. And so the grid was stressed, but the balancing authority, the people who run the, uh, the actual dispatch center managed to keep it going. It was great. Uh, and then they had to settle up between the plants that didn't come online and the plants that did come online. And it turned out that this complex formula paid $8 million more to plants that came online than it collected from plants that didn't come online. And, it, and, and, and so it had to go back to all the plants and, and gather up $8 million, <laughs> whether you came online or not. And, uh, and it was just, I, I just looked at that and said, they actually think that making a formula like this is how you run a market. That's what they think. Well, how can you do, how can you even think it? I'm sorry. I, 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 all the people involved are very good people and they're all doing the best they can, but the system is set up so that uh, if they're not in there battling for their own power plant to have some kind of advantage then they're not doing their job. Nobody is, nobody is worried about reliability, at least not very much. Yeah, that's very helpful to have that level of detail. So let's talk about solutions. <laughs> what, what, are, um, what are policy reforms, you know, what, what should happen? What kinds of policy reforms can we support? Well, I think we should support anything that supports reliability on the grid. And that can be putting responsibility for reliability back at the state level, for example, the way it used to be. It can be uh, some of the things that uh, Ontario is a RTO, but Ontario looked at the situation and said, we're not getting a reliable grid here. And so they have an underpinning of global payment to power plants and the auctions are on top of that. So that if, you're, if you get the global payment, you can probably be online and make money. And so it doesn't drive a reliable plant offline. The whole point of it, as a matter of fact, was not to drive the reliable uh, hydro or nuclear offline by plants that bid in uh, at zero, but plan to take the clearing price. <laughs> and and so, you know, I think I, I th people who live in Ontario. Uh, are very aware of how the grid has gone up and gone down and how, how it was once, uh, you know, straight auctions and then it had the global price. And, 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 and from their point of view, it's been a big saga. From my point of view, it's been a big success because they still have a certain level of auction, but they, they, they support their reliable plans. Haven't they had some just significant cost increases though in Ontario? Oh yeah, they did. But, but, but the, the, the significant cost increases came from the fact that they built 
a, a, a great uh, a number of like um, wind turbines that turned out not to be uh, necessary, but still ended up in the equivalent of a rate base. So in a way, the problem was the same as the overbuilding problems in the old regulated utilities. And so, I mean, there's no perfect way to do this, but at least they have a, a clean grid. And they, uh, what I mean is they, they have a, a grid that, that meets their needs and isn't dependent uh, on, um, on, uh, on renewables plus natural gas, which can be uh, formula for, for, for disaster because nothing is stored at a power plant. I don't like to see a northern country, northern area dependent on renewables plus natural gas because in the winter, uh, the natural gas may not be there. I mean, if I just step back and I just think about different things. So, I mean, I've studied Arizona a bit. And so they, you know, they have the biggest nuclear plant in the US, Palo Verde there. And you just think about, okay, this thing runs basically like clockwork for decades and decades and decades. And if you were, you know, you can make a long-term investment, it's going to get you super cheap, reliable, a very clean, safe electricity indefinitely. I mean, my basic idea, I don't have a, an exact policy, but these, if these are monopolies, which they are at least for now, shouldn't they just have a system of choosing vendors that is like long-term, low-cost reliability? So instead of this five-minute nonsense, why don't they think about, you know, take bids basically for the next... 20 years or something like that. Like, why can't they just have some arrangement where we're, we figure out, you just get smart people. Like, what is the, what's the best combination of assets for the next 20 years to get reliable electricity to the people of Arizona, given a certain level of variability and demand? Well, I, 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 I suggest in my book that um, we should definitely have a baseload plants. I mean, people, people who say, oh, there's no more baseload, but it's not true. Uh, baseload is the minimum demand at all time. And it's best, best met by um, reliable plants that just chug along like Palo Verde or, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly pro coal, but a coal plant could do that. Uh, what, what we can't do it is a wind turbine, you see. And so, I think that it should, if, if we're going to have a regional organization, I think the regional organization should plan for the region and be empowered to plan for the region. To look at the region and say, hmm, we have this amount of baseload, we need that amount of baseload plants, that'll be the cheapest. Hmm. We're having a lot of solar put on. Okay, we've got a duck curve growing. We're gonna to have to put on some fast ramping gas plants because we've got the duck curve. I mean, it, it's not really rocket science, but the thing is that people are not doing it because of uh, policy, uh, because of the idea that the grid doesn't need all these different kinds of plants. It doesn't need steady, base low plants and, and fast ramping plants. It's all going to be done with renewables and we just have to figure it out how, you know, it's just very difficult. I'm sorry. It, I, you, you know, I, I, I was a, uh, I worked in renewables for quite a few years and I was very, I was very much in favor of them and I'm, I'm, I'm still very much in favor of them where they can be used well. The trouble is they're totally overhyped. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think there's just a real question of where they can be used well. I mean, one of my pol pet policy ideas is that if you want to have different kinds of bids, I, I don't think the five minute system ever makes sense, but I'm totally in favor of having people bid with much higher reliability levels and they can put solar, wind, batteries and anything else into like a black box or a hybrid plant. So they can say, hey, we're going to deliver stuff and you can use whatever you want to put in there. But I think right now, the way it works is just what I call the, the uh, meanly, but the unreliables, they just get so much privilege and they're allowed to introduce all this unreliability onto the grid and everyone else has to pay for it. And I just don't see a fair way of doing that. So I think, you know, one way to do it is just to say, you have to deliver reliable power to the grid, how you get there, we don't care, but just allowing like Apple to just put a bunch of solar plants 
on there and then say, oh, we're renewable and everyone else gets screwed over. That just, I don't see any fair way of doing that, of adding these unreliables long-term. Well, I, I agree with you that, you know, if you really uh, wanted to have a market system for the grid, what you have to do is you have to have market specifications. In other words, as you said, we want you to have, we want to have a 500 megawatts. We don't care how you do it. Uh, it has to be up 90% of the time. And if it ever fails, when the grid is stressed, and here's the definition of stressed, you're going to be fined. I mean, it's not, it's not that hard to think that through, really. Yeah, I mean, at least if you're going to have these markets, and I think they're very precarious because they're not actual free markets, but if you're going to have these vendor policies, obviously reliability should be central uh, yeah. to the policy, not not deliberately omitted. No, I agree with you. They're not markets. I mean, our whole book is about they're not markets. You yeah. know? And, and I, I totally agree with you about that. But I was just trying to say that if you, in a real market, you really look at what you're buying. You don't look at the next five minutes and uh, the clearing price. And I mean, it, it's all just... Uh, absurd in a way. To be yeah, and I think it's a great, one of the great services of the book is it just establishes definitively, this is not a real market. This is a set of arbitrary rules. And if we're going to, if we are having these monopolies, we should make rules that actually lead to very reliable electricity at low cost for the long term. And we know enough to know that there are much better ways of doing it than this. One, one final question, because I know you have some activist experience. What do you recommend in terms of just the average person getting involved in this kind of thing? Well, I would say that it's very hard to get involved with the RTO level. You, can, you should keep track of your local PUC and see what they're doing and see how you can influence them to influence a, a reliable grid. Okay, the, your local public utilities commission will have open meetings and so forth. And FERC will actually announce that they are asking for public comments. So it, it's not easy to do. I would suggest that you, uh, online you can subscribe to Utility Dive. You should go to your RTO uh, website and get familiar with it and see if you can get on a mailing list for their weekly updates or something like that. And it'll be kind of a fog. You'll be kind of finding your way through the fog, but after a while you begin to understand what the weekly updates really mean and so forth. I mean, so, uh, and the other thing is if you can get organized with some other people so you can discuss it, you can write letters together, I mean, that is activist, uh, I mean, in, in the real sense of trying to have important uh, citizen and intellectual input to the decision making. Is that, is that, yeah, I, that's I, good. That's okay. good. I, That's I, good. I, I just, you know, sometimes there would be people um, with the Vermont Yankee, there would be people marching along saying, shut it down, shut it down, it's killing us. And then I would come out with a, a banner saying, clean reliable power, you know, but this, none of that happens in, at the grid level. I mean, there aren't, uh, there, the activism is, is in, in, many, in many ways more fun because it's more intellectual and I'm terribly intellectual, <laughs> as you can tell by my long-winded talking. But it is, uh, you, you can influence things if you're willing to write letters, go to PUC hearings and so forth. Got it. Well, yeah, I think your, your book is definitely making a contribution to the average citizen being able to understand what's going on and to be angry yeah, about it. So just final question, where can people learn more about your work and follow your work? Okay, I have a, um, I have a website with the unusual name of MeredithAngwin.com. And that's A-N-G-W-I-N? Yes, A-N-G-W-I-N. Um, it's my husband's name, and uh, we've been married for over 50 years, and uh, it's a Cornish name, uh, A-N-G-W-I-N, Meredith Angwin. And uh, so, um, and, and then uh, you can also, um, on the website, you can um, 
You can sign up to get my uh, uh, periodic newsletters, which come out. Oh, they should come out more often. I'd say once every two, three weeks. I, I'm trying to get it to once a week, but I don't seem to manage that. And then, um, then you can buy buy the book. Uh, I, I I suggest uh, buying the book. Uh, the the information in this book is um, is hard won, and it's also not the usual thing you're going to read about the grid. Yeah, that's that's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah, definitely recommend it. I'm looking forward to finishing it myself. And I'm grateful to you for writing it. And also, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for inviting me. All right, I my pleasure. Enjoyed it. Thanks again to Meredith Angwin for joining me. I think it, it came out during that interview. I'm very passionate about this subject. I regard the whole state of our grid and the claims about it as just incredibly, as just filled with dishonesty, misrepresentations, and there's just so much justice that's needed. And because the grid is so inexplicable, or at least unexplained or, or misexplained to so many people, it just allows all of this borderline or totally fraudulent activity to occur. So I'm grateful to Meredith for clarifying a lot of these things, and I plan to do more myself to clarify these things in the future, including more on energytalkingpoints.com. All right. With that said, let's wrap up. As always, if you have any questions, comments, love mail, or hate mail, email me at alex at alexepstein.com. To get on my mailing list, go to alexepsteinlist.com to get the latest energy talking points. Follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash alexepstein, and also visit the website energytalkingpoints.com. Next week, I will be back with another guest. This is going to be my former boss, Yaron Brook, uh, executive chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute. And we are going to talk about energy and finance, the whole world of ESG and what to do about it. That world is a mess. Yaron is going to help me untangle it. So look forward to that. I definitely am. All right. That's it for this week. Until next week, I'm Alex Epstein. This has been Power Hour. Power Hour. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of energy. Power Hour. The antidote to shallow thinking about energy issues.